I try to learn from high, medium, and low, meaning I want to learn from Kara, right? I want to learn from the CEO of Hintwater, but I also want to learn from people that are just the executive there, that they live and breathe the space. They're the category manager for retail. I want to learn from them, but I also want to learn from the consumer. I want to learn from the customer and why. You gotta pick yourself up, go backwards, and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Andrew Dudham, founder of Hims, Erica Nardini, CEO of Barstool Sports, Daniel Dubois and Whitney Tingle, co-founders of Sakara Life, and much, much more. Plus, we asked the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Stoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara Golden from Unstoppable, and we are very, very excited to have Dan Fleischman here today. Welcome. Thank you. So, Dan, thanks so much for being here today. We're both at the conference today yes. speaking, the HPLT conference. Yep. Very, very excited. So, Dan, if for those of you who don't know Dan, we're going to talk a little bit about his company, Elevator, today, Elevator Studio. But Dan's a leading authority on social media. We were just chatting that Dan had a beverage company ages ago yep, in and a uh, in a former life. So, we uh, have that in common. And We'll talk more about just social media and influencer sure. marketing overall, but we also want to talk about your passion project and your nonprofit because I think that that is super, super yeah. cool and what more for-profit companies should be doing and, exactly. and getting into, you know, really figuring out what is their what is their why yeah. and what else can they do to really help people. He's a regular speaker, advises companies on just all aspects of social media influencers. Should you have social media influencers, yeah. which is a hot topic today? Yes. Should you not? Yeah, lots of great stuff. At age 23, he took the, the beverage company that we mentioned public. We can talk a little bit more yeah. about that experience. And because I know that that's always something that entrepreneurs want to know. Do I take a company right. public? Do I not take a company <laughs> yeah. public? And then last but not least, actually two last but not least, he uh, founded the online poker site Victory Poker. Yeah. Super cool. And within one year, built it into the third largest online poker brand in mm -hmm. the world. Crazy. He's a co-author of a best-selling book, How to Set Up Your Business for Under $1,000. I have a book coming out in October. Nice. So I'm also very interested yep. to hear how you got that book out there yep. and for people to hear. So anyway, welcome. Thank you. Thank welcome. you. Thank you. So uh, first of all, you're a serial entrepreneur with a variety of successful businesses under your belt. And I'd love to hear more about like so 17-ish, that's yeah. kind of how yeah. you, like the, the beginning of Dan getting going. Yeah. So where, where were you and where was your head through? So I was in San Diego. I was working three jobs, saving up money uh, to pay for college. Somehow we survived on $24,000 for a family of four in LA. And so I wanted to make sure I wasn't a burden. So I was working three jobs, selling cotton candy at the stadium and working at Ruby's Diner with a sailor cap on my head and working for a stockbroker and just... All hours of the day and night, just working, working, working to save up this money. Saved up $43,000 during those couple of years. Wow. And I was ready. I'm going to San Diego State. Here we go. And, but at the same time, I launched an online, a clothing line. And we trademarked this brand for 300 different products. So I go to the clothing convention. I'm 17 and a half. I'm not even allowed to be at the convention. Can't even register for a booth, et cetera. And we write a million dollars in orders. I had no idea. I thought I was a millionaire, except I had nobody to actually manufacture a million dollars in orders. I didn't have the four or 500 grand it takes to manufacture those orders. I wasn't a vendor. I couldn't get certified. I couldn't get approved by these chain stores. Like I did, like yeah. I was a kid with hoodie, An idea. hoodies, hats, yeah. and t-shirts on a, on a rack, on a wall, on a, a 10 foot booth. Right. So my older brother and my partner's father, they started giving us all this advice. My mom comes in and helps save the day, gets us structured with, you know, company stuff. And so Within like the next few months, we were a clothing company. We were actually manufacturing, selling to chain stores. I found a big manufacturer who I'm still friends with 20 years later. But I go to San Diego State one day 
And I walk in and the teacher says, Dan, you don't go here. I was like, what do you mean you just said my name? He's like, no, I don't know who you are anymore. I said, no, but you do because you just said my name. He was like, no, you don't go here. You can sit here if you want, but don't come back tomorrow. Because you had missed too many classes? Yep. or Once you miss more than three classes, off with your head. And so I had a showroom in New York at the Empire State Building. I had a warehouse in L.A. I thought I was the cat's pajamas. Like I was like, what are you talking about? I'm here. I'm trying to make time for both. So that's it. That was my last experience in college. It was like, it was frustrating because I wanted to do it. And then I just went to real life university. So over the next few years, we got into 5,500 stores for the clothing and got a big licensing deal with Starter Apparel overseas in the UK for nine and a half million dollars. And so all of a sudden, as I was getting screwed over along the way and bad manufacturers, bad this, chain stores not paying, all the things I had no idea about would happen in the clothing business being 18, 19, 20, 21, this royalty from that large deal with Starter Apparel helped kind of save the day. Every quarter we had a, you know, saving grace. Get a check. Yeah. And so 23 is when we decided to take it public on the stock market. I didn't know what that meant. I, you know, I spent a year and a half and $2 million of legal fees and accounting and auditors and to, to, thing, to things I just had no idea what an 8K and a 10Q and all these letters you couldn't spell. And so we went public. And then the next four years is when we were pushing the energy drink. And so you went public before the beverage company. I went public I mean, for the beverage company. For the beverage. I needed to raise capital to be able to prepare for the energy drink. We had good revenue with the clothing company, but not enough that we could take out to really launch a beverage at scale. We didn't want to do it like small. Um, mostly we didn't want to do it small because we got advice from somebody that had a beverage brand. And he said, you need a lot of money. To actually like you do, do need this. a lot of money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right even, or a even, launch a beverage company even with success <laughs> yeah the more success you have the more money you need and it's like this weird cash 22 you think if you get a million dollar order that that's it you made it yeah how the heck do you it, do it yeah it and, doesn't float yeah right and i actually like talk about this and during these speeches i'm like if you get a million dollar order you might go bankrupt because you're not going to get paid for 30 to 90 days after you ship it depending on the retailer well, that's like five months from the time of your order. I was like, what are you guys going to do if you get a million dollar order? You need 500 grand to make it. And it's January 1st and you don't get paid until May 1st. Yeah. I tell entrepreneurs this all the time. And, you know, even if you can get, you know, receivables financing, I right. mean, you're not going to get receivables financing until you've got, you know, a few years under your belt. Right. And, you know, it's just not going to happen. So and what, if get- what if your products hit water and it's good and they reorder and you still haven't been paid yet? And then they reorder again a third time and you still haven't been paid for the first order. And then they reorder again and you haven't been paid for the first one. And no one tells you this, right? <laughs> no. When you're, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Even when you're high, you don't realize that you're at low at the same time. So for those four years, we'll go over that later, I guess. But that was the beverage world. And then that's when I started the online poker site. What was crazy about that is it was the third biggest brand in the world. And then online poker was shut down in America. The number one and number two, they both got seized by the FBI billions of dollars were seized it was called black friday yep and so i didn't get shut down i didn't get a knock on the door but i willingly closed the company the same four-day period because i was like i don't know what's going to happen here and i want to be able to sleep at night so i paid back forty-one thousand people manually like i had my whole team manually paying everybody back but that was the biggest wake-up call because i had lost my company overnight just a company doing crazy revenue by myself no like and so to me it's still a failure scoreboard is a scoreboard if you go back and look at it whether it's my competitors put me in the situation doesn't matter the government put me in the situation it's scoreboard is a scoreboard so that was the biggest wake-up call and that's when i decided i was never going to have all my eggs in one basket again mm-hmm. that's when i became an angel investor that's when i started the social media agency that's when i started the charity all of it happened in the same few months so from the worst moment business moment in my life came all the i guess best things that's awesome well i think what you describe is what great entrepreneurs talk about. And oftentimes no one can actually, you know, share that advice to you. You can give that advice to people. And so often it goes in one ear right. and out the other. Right? right. But you live through it. Right. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I tell people all the time, like the, you know, the smartest thing for any entrepreneur, whether you're in a beverage business or clothing business or beauty business, is to get into one outlet yeah. and then, you know, Clap your hands, right? right? Have a drink, whatever you need to do in order to, you know, celebrate that and then get into as many other places as as possible where you can really service 
you know, the brand and it makes sense for the brand, but then also expand so that you don't have too much weight in any one thing. Absolutely. So I think it's a it's a huge thing. And frankly, with funding, too, I think right. it's the exact same situation. It's like you don't want, you know, one bank or one investor I think or, or it's, one retailer or one retailer. Yeah. It's the exact same lessons learned along the way. That's great. So I read that you orchestrated more than $68 million in deals between brands and social media influencers with your company. And and I'd love to hear more about that and, sure. and what made you, I mean, it sounds like it was all part of the journey of yeah, you going and starting yeah. it and progression of it, but I'd love to hear more about that. So I started angel investing a lot and a bit wildly, like I was very picky, but I did too many at the same time. And I started doing some of the brands wanted me to do social media stuff for them, even though I wasn't a social media agency. And so it kind of just naturally became a social media agency because I knew these influencers, if you will, before influencer was a word and celebrities that didn't know what to charge for a tweet. And they were charging $75,000 for a tweet when they were worth a couple of grand. And like, it was this weird wild, wild west of just people just had no idea. And so I formed the agency back then. And right at the same time when the fashion novas and fit tees, all the Instagram products, if you will, were coming out. And so I started doing these campaigns. And I'd have the Kardashians posting for Fashion Nova or Fit Tea or these other brands. And through that, everybody started coming to me because they're like, who, who did that? Because there wasn't that many brands. You can name the first few Instagram brands. And so I, I just naturally evolved into an actual agency. I mean, we spent a couple hundred million since then. It's mind boggling how much we spend. We're this big. If you think about it, my staff's tiny. My team's like, the social media execution just doesn't take what it takes to do a TV campaign or a billboard campaign or a marketing campaign or a magazine campaign or a bus campaign. You don't need as many humans to, those take a long, long time. I can do a hint water campaign this weekend. I Interesting. 60 influencers with 144 million followers combined. And if they have the bottle, the caption and what they're supposed to, their content's supposed to be, they could literally run it tomorrow. And it's crazy where magazines, TV, radio, everything takes three to six months and a lot of planning and a lot of things to go through. I can also have the report back on Monday. Like it's, it's so fascinating to me because I don't say don't do the other things. I just say do a little bit also. I did a big campaign for DraftKings and it was really fun. It was like DJ Khaled, Amanda Cerny, all these different characters posting about this brand. And we did it all in a two day period. And they actually were upset about it. Like, this is too fast for us. We have, you know, large corporations need time to analyze and plan. I'm like, I can do the next campaign again if you want to practice again. How did I do in comparison to what you did last week? Like, oh, you're actually our number two of all of our ad spend for the week. I said, okay, well, what was number one? I said, okay, well, that was TV. How much did you spend on TV? 18 million. Crazy. What was number three? Well, that was radio. How much did you spend? Nine million. I said, so I beat number three with 500 grand compared to your nine million. I'm not saying give me nine million, but. Yeah. Well, it's it's hard. I mean, I think it's harder for the more established brands. Of let's call them that, yeah. right? Because you're, you know, they know, they think they know how to measure that. Yes. Right. And yes. so they're they're not really sure how to measure this. I mean, most of these companies even aren't even selling online. Right. Right. And so that's a whole other you know, topic, because if, you know, even if you're able to show success on the, you know, impressions brand and, right. and impressions, sure. et cetera, then how do you it, translate it to retail? Right. Yes. And they, they have no idea. I mean, a lot of them, I mean, I figured this out. So 40% of our overall business for Hint is online. Whoa. And so we sell on Amazon, but we also sell on drinkhint.com. Right. And that was my world. And what I came from ran AOL's e-commerce for yep. seven years and and sort of grew up in, in that world. But it's interesting because when I started Hint, I was really I was doing what you were doing, hustling yep. and getting Hint into, you know, lots of stores yep. up in San Francisco where I live and then New York and then sort of came into the middle and now we're, you know, in lots of different outlets all over the US. Yep. But it's interesting because what I realized a few years ago when I first launched our business on Amazon was a, I wasn't getting data from Amazon, which upset me. Sure. And then I said, like, why am I so upset? I don't get data from Whole Foods or Target or any of these. So right. why am I like so upset right. with Amazon? Right. If I really want my data, then I should set up my own site at drinkhint.com, which yep. is what we did. And so for us, we love Amazon. I mean, Amazon's great. People go on Amazon 
they it's know natural the brand. for them to just swipe and that's it. Yeah. Right. And they know the brand. It's going to show up in five seconds. And... Yeah. But Amazon will never carry. We have over 20 flavors. And then right. we, we launch sunscreen and we launch deodorant. And we yeah. launch lo- lots of different categories. And so we launch all of that on our site first. Right. And so I always tell people that, you know, the consumer now who really knows Hint believes that, you know, we have everything on our site and knows that we have everything on our site. They can still go to Amazon. They can go to Target. They can go to Costco. They can go buy our product wherever they want to buy it. But I think, you know, that's such a key thing that a lot of large, large brands just don't really understand is that what you guys are doing is really building awareness, but also building awareness potentially, you know, on where to find their brand and, and online, et cetera. So that's very, very, very cool. Well, we should talk more sure. about that for sure on a side note yeah. there. So what do you look for when you're connecting brands? You know, you mentioned a few different DJ Khalid yeah. and, and, uh, so, and uh, so I like to look at category fits the, like inside of my office, which is just two blocks from here. We built a full fledged gym because we work with mostly fitness influencers. Mm-hmm. I say mostly, but half of them are fitness influencers in the beauty makeup space, the fitness space, food space. So we have these protein brands and CBD brands that we're doing campaigns for. So I like to do niche influencers for certain categories. I like to do influencers that really focus on an overarching category. So somebody might be in the fitness and health space, but it still applies to CBD or still applies to supplements or still applies to food. Doesn't mean that they have to be a beauty influencer to beauty. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? There's some beauty influencers that are fantastic for food products just because the people still want to live their lifestyle and they want to understand why that makeup artist drinks that or eats that. Why did they drink hint water? And that, so some people, it's a, I'll call them lifestyle influencers, even if they're a niche. Separate from that, we do mass appeal ones. Some influencers just have 2.4 million followers. They're not a niche. They're not necessarily the funny one or they're not necessarily just the good looking one. They're not necessarily just one thing. And so some of those are just for mass awareness. Those I get really good prices on because a niche influencer gets way higher. So beauty and makeup influencers get here. It's not close. Like the next closest category is fitness. But this is a big gap. Mm-hmm. The delta is humongous. Beauty and makeup influencers get more than anybody. Not close. Then you start to get into the mom category. The moms do so well. I mean, they are so good because they're so authentic. And the reason that beauty influencers do the best is because they start their videos without their makeup on. Mm-hmm. And people feel like they trust them. It's not the perfect photo. It's not the perfect image. They're boys or girls that are doing the makeup videos. They are doing so bare face. Like, this is me. I w- just Authentic, woke up. Yeah. So that breaks the barrier for people that are watching them. They feel like they know them. Same with the moms. The moms are showing they got two kids running around. They still have their life to their busy life. They're the businesswoman. But then the kid throws the table over and Cheerios are on the floor. That is relatable. The perfect glamour photo is not. Yeah, I, I totally get it. I mean, it's aspirational, too. So it's it's interesting. I think, you know, the challenge with beverages overall is that so many people believe that they're paid endorsement deals. Right. Right. Yep. And so you look at, you know, for some reason, I don't think beauty necessarily has that same kind of, you know, feeling in the mind of the yep. consumer. I don't know why, but I think it still is, you know, like. There, there's a learning in there often with the videos yes. like you mentioned or you know i think fitness is kind of the same thing yes. like you know but it's it's interesting it's always you know sort of stumped me you know on the on the beverage side of the world exactly what you know how does it vary and what are the right influencers for different categories yes. it's really interesting so you talk about well i, I should say as entrepreneurs we are constantly learning right sure. and you talked a little Non-stop. bit about your journey how would you describe that your philosophy on learning so I try to learn from high, medium, and low, meaning I want to learn from Kara, right? I want to learn from the CEO of Hintwater, but I also want to learn from people that are just the executive there, that they live and breathe the space. They're the category manager for retail. I want to learn from them, but I also want to learn from the consumer. I want to learn from the customer and why. So a lot of times I would go into stores, whether it was a beverage product or any brand I'm working on, and I want to see the customer, what they do and why. The same thing on social media. I look at the comments because I want to understand why. Like when somebody posts something, I'm doing a campaign for a hair care brand and Kylie Jenner says, blah, 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 I love this hair care brand. I go and look at the comments because I want to understand 
Are they yelling at her? Do they love it? Are they obsessed? Are they asking questions? Like, do they want this hair care? Do they hate it? Do they think it's a paid ad? I really want to learn from them in between asking what does the agency think? What did her marketing department think? What did the brand think? So I'm constantly learning from everybody. I want to high, medium, low. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. I want to learn at all costs. That's why I go to so many events. I speak at so many events because I sit there and learn from the people that I, I want to learn. Yeah. And even though you're running the agency, it sounds like you're still, you know, hands on. I, I mean, you've got the... a team of people, but you're oh, still yeah. like in there. Every client is run on a group chat. Every campaign is run on a group chat. And we hand to hand combat text with every influencer. That's awesome. We are so, very hands on. So do you take comments down if people are, you yes. know. So I have a very strict rule. Don't feed the trolls. So what happens is if Hint Water donated $1 million today, mm -hmm. there would be people commenting, well, they could have donated $1.1 mm -hmm. Totally. There's nothing. And we've can, had that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, Jeff Bezos donates $10 billion. <laughs> That's nothing to him. Yeah. He, he, What's the point? Yeah. Right? He has other categories he donates to, and he can keep donating. That's just the amount he chose for today. Oh, he donated a couple million to the Australia wildfires. That's like four cents to a human. He's not obligated to donate to the Australia wildfires. He's doing it willingly. And what he might turn around, do a bigger check the next day. But we, the trolls will always demonize you. And you can't, there is no changing their mind because they're preset to just want you to feed them. And the feeding is responding. Because even if you argue a valid point, well, hey, I donated a million dollars and it did this and this and this, your, your common sense is irrational to them. They're never, ever, ever, ever going to change their mind about it. So I always just tell people block and delete and they just delete from the earth. Yeah. Never hear from them. No, I, I totally agree with you. I'm very active on Twitter yeah. and it's, I would say that, you know, it's a small percentage, sure. but every once in a while there's somebody that comes in there and, you know, oftentimes, you know, I don't necessarily see it coming, Yeah. you know, and, and I'm just trying to, you know, have a conversation, bring them into our community, ask a question yeah. or answer a question that they have. And it's really interesting. You know, it's like it, like I said, it's very rare. But I also think that there's a power of a community and a trust that your audience is building up sure. with you, too, that I now find when, you know, I don't even ask for help uh, along the way. But there's a whole lot of people and they don't necessarily work for Hint. Of course. That are coming in sure. and being like, hey, get yeah, out of here. Exactly. Right. Yes, and it's just absolutely. like in real life. Yes. And I'm sure it's a, it's the same thing. It's absolutely. Like, Look, if you don't want to be here. If you're being negative, right. like go. There's an unfollow go button away. right there. Yeah. Which is, you know, I mean, it sort of gives me hope for humanity in a sure. way that, you know, they've never met me yep. in person yet. They, you know, they're like, she's she's nice. She's cool. Right. She's just doing her thing, yeah. whatever. So I think it's great. So let's talk about passion and yeah. some of the, I'm really focused right now on a clean water initiative that I'm going to be hopefully launching in Congress actually nice. this spring to clean up our water supply. And it ends up that only much to my surprise, I learned last year that only 30 states actually test for lead wow. in water. And of those states, there's no repercussions if they don't actually, even those 30 actually don't test. And so many people are saying that a lot of the problems with the water supply has to do with the pipes. Hmm. And so it's too expensive to fix the pipes. So hmm. people just are ignoring the issue. And so the average consumer thinks that, you know, somebody's watching, right. the EPA is watching, right. we saw what happened in, in Flint, Michigan, yeah. and then um, Detroit yeah. is really bad. And then most recently newer. So I'm actually working uh, with some Congress people and hoping to draft a bill by the end of this month that will actually take this to Congress to nice. make mandatory testing in all 50 states. And we're going to start with schools. And if they don't actually test for uh, lead in schools, then they could actually get education funds held back, wow. um, which is, uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's, it's a little scary. Sure. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens with this current administration, yeah. whether how far we can get it. But I think that there's, you know, I've learned a ton about water along the way. And uh, my focus has been on, you know, helping people to drink better tasting water with no sugar, no sweeteners in it. But yeah. through that process, I've learned a lot about lead and PFAS and arsenic and lots of stuff that is in the water that we remove before bottling our products. So I really believe that entrepreneurs stumble into finding, you know, problems that are kind of bigger problems sure. beyond even your company. Yep. And I think that people should actually jump in and try and fix a problem. So yep. 
this is what you have done in my mind yeah. with, you know, Model Citizen Fund, where, tell us a little bit about that. So eight years ago, I realized that I couldn't go raise billions of dollars and I can't, that's not me. So I wanted to figure out something that I could have a true cause and effect and people could see it right away. And so I started to focus on homelessness. So I spent five months interviewing homeless people in different cities, San Diego, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Riverside, just random towns on the West Coast. And I would ask them first if I could film them. Otherwise, if they didn't, that's fine. And I didn't post any of it. I just wanted to film so I could analyze. And I had a group of friends that would just go through and say, okay, what do they keep asking for? And so that's how we came up with the 150 items that go into our backpacks. The backpack itself was a big deal for them because they were often getting plastic bags or trash bags or brown paper bags that would fade away. And so they just didn't have a good carrying case. So the backpack was the main focus for us. And so it's about half food and water as the out of the 150 items. And then about a third of it's cleaning supplies for their hands. Again, these are things that are not going to change their lives forever. There's some items inside that they could actually utilize full time. There's sleeping bags, poncho, watch. There's some things that will last them a lot longer. And then certain things that to help them keep moving afterwards. There's books, uh, prepaid debit cards. I want to add cell phones, like prepaid cell phones at some point. But it's all self-funded. So people are allowed to donate, but it's 100% charity, meaning I cover all staff, all overhead, all marketing, all expenses forever the last eight years and forever the next, as long as I'm alive. So we will always be a 100% charity, which was a big focus for me. And I really don't ask via social ever people to donate. I ask them to replicate. You don't need me to make a backpack with 150 items inside. You can make a bag in your hometown with 30 items or 40 items or 200 items, whatever you want. I just want people to do the same thing I'm doing in their towns, anywhere in the world, to make a bag with 10 items or 30 or 50. Have you seen people do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So you started... You started, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's amazing. And I try to make it. I try to do it so they can see how easy it is. Mm-hmm. What I'm doing is not rocket science. I'm just able to get those 150 items really, really inexpensive because our warehouse, they're the largest supplier of small goods in America. That's how I found them. And since then, I've set, I do all my business through them. Everything's been great. But it all started with me going to them eight years ago, saying, "Hey, you're the largest supplier of small goods in America. I need all the small goods you got to give to homeless people." And so. I didn't realize that the number one most requested item is socks. The number two most requested item wasn't even on our list of 150 items. It's duct tape. All these military vets, all these homeless people kept saying duct tape. It wasn't even in our radar. And it's just what they fix. It's how they fix their clothes, how they fix their stuff, how they fix their bags. It's just their their little fixer up. It's their little little magic. So who makes duct tape? I don't know. I don't even know the brand. Is it 3M or is (laughs) it? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, we, so, so 3M, if you're listening, yeah. donate a lot of duct, duct tape. tape. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, so we have a roll of duct tape in every bag. And and then certain brands will send us stuff in and out. But mostly out of the 150 items, I'm just buying them at super, super wholesale prices. And then, so what happens is we go give it out in San Diego, LA, Vegas, all of our West Coast cities. But then we'll ship it to women abuse shelters, teen abuse shelters, and orphanages around the world. And I love it. Yeah, we try to keep it very simple, straightforward. If somebody... We can ship it backpacks to their homes or their offices. They can go give it out to their staff or just tell us a city or town or just let us go do it ourselves. Have you heard back from from people that have received these backpacks? Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, I bet. Oh, yeah. And how great does that make you? I, I love seeing it like three weeks later or three months later or a year later, just seeing them with the backpack. I love it. I, I want to actually do figure out a color for the backpack to make a brand from it so that I, it's easier for everybody to recognize. Like, oh, there's the Melissa's and backpacks. I love it. That's that's super great. So what's one thing you love to talk about, but people never ask you? Um, I think it's also just why I do all my stuff for free. Like all my events are free. All my charities, are, like my big focus is like it's 100% charity. My events are 100% free. Like it's to make it that me charging for my events, the difference wouldn't change my life. And so I don't want people to go to my events based on $100 ticket price or 500 bucks or 1000 bucks. I want them to go to learn, network, et cetera. Well, that starts to really make the people around me wonder, like, you're spending six figures a year to keep these events free. You're spending six figures a year to keep your charity free. You're, this is going to start to compound a lot. The more and more and more events you do, what are you going to do at scale? I'm always going to keep those parts of my life free, no matter how expensive it is, because I know stuff happens from it. I don't have an exact ROI. I don't have an ask. I don't have, there's no sponsors, no ticket sales. There's no... 
Right. The more you're out there, the more you're giving back. I, I know stuff's happening. Whether it happens for me or not, I don't really care. I know stuff is going to happen around me in my world. But I've seen so many companies get funded from my events. I've seen so many people, their their life changes or they get so excited about going out and giving out backpacks. I see so many people meet and then end up dating, getting married from my events or married, business married. They invest in their company and they become business married for years. Like so many things happen from them that to me, it's just it's worth the expense and the efforts and the time to throw these all these events and deal with this charity stuff because I just know so much stuff happens. And I think the butterfly effect is what I care about. I think the people replicating all this stuff is what I care about. I think that the more you get out there too, and you talk about these things and people absorb yes. it too, you're helping so many people. So that's, that's amazing. So what would you tell your 17 year old self now? The person who's like yeah. getting in the car, going down right. to San Diego, what would yeah. you, what would you, I'm sure it was, you had some scary times. For sure. Had, of course. You know, some, some so, great times too, but uh, sign contracts with everyone, including your mom. Interesting. And when I say contract, I'm not going to sue my mom. She's one of my, my not one of she is my biggest fan and supporter. But the point is making just like a memorandum of understanding or a scope of work. So if your mom, when you're 14, says, okay, go do these chores, and in your mind, you think if I go do these chores, she's going to give me 20 bucks, but there's no clarity on it or when it's going to happen. So I'm the little 14 year old boy. I go do my chores. Friday comes around. I'm hoping for 20 bucks. She doesn't hand it to me. I don't ask her. Monday comes around three days later. I now resent her. She didn't give me 20 bucks. She would have. She just didn't know. She didn't know that's what. So understand what, the expectations yeah. in there. Yeah. I think that's that's really, really awesome. So uh, I always ask two other questions. So what's your favorite hint flavor? Well, I like this a lot. The I like pineapple? Yeah, the pineapple one. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And what makes you unstoppable? I'm relentless. I work day and night. I don't I don't mind failure. I'm not ashamed of anything. I expect failure because I try to do so many things. So how can you stop me if I'm not? I think you're fearless too. You know, you don't like have this idea that I can't go into, you know, the clothing industry right. because I've never been in clothing or fashion sure. or whatever or beverages or influencers. I mean, you just are you're like appreciating and embracing the journey, which I think is Awesome. Thank you. Super, super great. So where do people find you? Uh, so all my social media is all the same. It's just at Dan Fleischman. And that's an important thing. Your social media accounts for your business or personal should always be the same social media handle. So it's easier for people to find you. Absolutely agree. So where are you most active on? Uh, Instagram is my home base. I make most of my content for Instagram and then I repurpose it on the different platforms. On the other things. Yeah. That's awesome. Great. Very cool. Well, thanks so much, Dan. Thank you for having me. It's great. Thanks. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. unstoppable. unstoppable.